like to call to order the first meeting of the Assembly Health Policy Committee. And let's start by going around the room and identifying ourselves. Mr. Gates? I'm Dean Gates, Susan Gates. Fred Dyson. Suzanne LeFran. Christopher Costa. Dick Craig. Boris Sunbar. And any, um, to go around and identify any members of the public? I'm Natasha Pineda, which is the Department of Health. Thank you all for being here. We are noticed until 1.30, um, so we have an hour. There are, I believe, agendas. There are agendas in the back? Yes, back there as well. And um, our first item will be a confirmation hearing for Natasha Pineda, the new Department of Health and Human Services Director. And if, if you wouldn't mind, Ms. Pineda, coming and joining us here. Sure. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, oh, thank you. And I'd like to note that the mayor has joined us. And also, Odette Kraut and Jason Bachman. Um, Ms. Bachman, I'm sorry. It's probably better if you identify yourself. <laughs> so we have the staff of the mayor. Jason Bachman said that we the staff of the mayor. Thank you for being here. Um, Ms. Pineda, if you would go ahead and please introduce yourself and um, perhaps describe your experience in public health leadership, uh, particularly in setting, establishing public health priorities, we'll go ahead and start. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to thank my leadership team for coming to support me today. Um, my name is Natasha Pineda. I grew up in uh, Portland, Oregon. I came to Alaska in 2002. Um, my I, husband and two children, we live over in what we like to kindly call Spinardigan, which is right near Fish Creek Park between, um, uh, we're in South Turnigan and Spinard, but we participate in a lot of community activities in our neighborhood. Uh, we love living here and um, we've been here for quite a bit. Um, I grew up, as I said, in Portland. My passion and interest in public health really started as a child. My parents were a therapeutic foster home, and so we spent about 20 years taking care of, of kids that came from homes of child abuse, alcohol abuse, all of those different things, as well as developmental disabilities and things. And so I spent most of my formative years in that community setting really taking care of of kids in an environment that um, wasn't being supported where they, they were from. So um, when I decided to come to Alaska in 2002, I came with the Boys and Girls Clubs of Alaska, and I came specifically to do a Smart Moves training for the statewide operations. Smart Moves is a program called Skills Mastery and Resistance Training, and it's primarily focused on substance abuse prevention uh, at developmentally appropriate levels using a peer-led model, which is essentially training teens to teach their own peers about the um, harms of using substances and focusing on positive life choices. Uh, from there, I, uh, at that organization, I worked on the Red Ribbon Coalition, uh, which I don't know is really active anymore, but it was very active in the early 2000s, and it was chaired by Lisa Murkowski, um, Harvey Goring from the DEA, and the superintendent of the Anchorage School District. And we worked in Anchorage as well as um, statewide to do uh, substance abuse prevention throughout school districts and communities annually during what is called Red, Red Ribbon Week. I uh, moved on from there to work at the Division of Behavioral Health, uh, worked under the guidance and mentorship of Diane Casto, who has been a leader in the state for a long time related to um, child abuse, substance abuse prevention, um, alcohol prevention, and those kinds of things. So in that position is where I really started to formalize my um, community planning and organization uh, related to public health initiatives. And at that time, I also started uh, pursuing my bachelor's degree and then my master's degree in public health. Um, in that role, and I think some of you may have my resume, 
Um, I chaired the Alaska Interagency Committee on Preventing Underage Drinking, and we issued a report in 2012, which is available online, and that includes um, five strategic initiatives designed to support environmental strategies throughout the state to address underage drinking. I think they're currently in an, an updated process. And if I could just pause you for oh. a moment to let the record reflect that you've been joined by Mr. Kraus. Yeah, Madam Chair, I would appreciate if you'd speak a little more slowly. Slowly, okay. <laughs> a little louder, Fred. I'm okay with that. And, uh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I have some questions. Sure. Do you want me to stop for questions or just kind of proceed and um, keep going for now? Okay. Um, during my stay at the Division of Behavioral Health, in addition to working as the chair for the Interagency Committee on Preventing Underage Drinking, I also oversaw the governor's initiative to prevent domestic violence and sexual assault. It was a pilot project in four communities throughout the state. So we worked with those four communities, which included Bethel, Dillingham, Ketchikan, and Sitka, to develop uh, and implement um, community-wide prevention initiatives to work on decreasing the impact of domestic violence and sexual assault uh, in youth in those communities. Um, in addition, in that position, I worked a lot with co community coalitions, did a lot of training around community coalitions, helped around, there's 26 communities that I oversaw as a grant manager who had substance abuse related community coalitions and um, worked to help them strategically align um, more impactfully with those community agencies that were also doing work. A lot of times, or at least at that time, and it, it may have changed, a lot of communities have multiple coalitions working to prevent all sorts of things, but they don't necessarily look strategically where they can align together and where their goals are the same. And so there's a lot of resources going into communities but not a lot of coordination of those um, activities. And so I worked a lot in that area trying to see if we can coordinate better with tobacco, we could, you know, if alcohol prevention could coordinate better with tobacco, suicide prevention, and all these other behavioral health related issues in their communities. Um, I went from there to the Mental Health Trust Authority and at the Mental Health Trust Authority, I was a program officer. A couple of the areas that I had um, policy oversight over and, and helped work on were the behavioral health mini grants, which um, are you guys familiar with the Mental Health Trust Authority? Everyone? Okay. The behavioral health mini grants are about a million dollars a year that are designed to provide supplemental support to beneficiaries of the trust. And uh, if you have a case manager and you just are moving into an apartment for the very first time, but you don't have any resources, you can apply through your case manager to get the things that you need to have a startup apartment, or if you need um, dental work, or you know any kind of ancillary thing that you might need as a beneficiary as you're transitioning um, to support you. So we got to work on that project, which was a lot of fun. Um, there's nothing better than being able to give people things that they need uh, to make their lives better. Uh, my focus area, at the Mental Health Trust Authority was substance abuse. So I worked on um, initiatives including Recover Alaska, which many of you may be familiar with, and the Title IV rewrite, which has been a multi-year process. I think they're still working on it, and I think they're hopeful for some action on that in the next year's legislative session. In addition, I helped to develop the Reentry Co Coalition's multiple-year funding kind of scheme, and including what, what should those coalitions uh, be doing in their first and second years, what kinds of community assessments, community needs, um, and cataloging those, and, and helping the trust create a funding mechanism that would help support build capacity in multiple communities around the state. Um, in addition, at the trust, I really moved into working on Medicaid uh, as an area and health reform in general. Um, then I came and I worked at the Department of Health and Human Services in the role that Blanche Mormon currently holds. So I had uh, have a pretty good understanding of the workings of the department and really enjoyed my time there. I was um, recruited to work with the Department of Administration on a study called the Healthcare Authority Study, which was really looking at all publicly funded um, health insurance and uh, looking at whether or not there was a better way for the state 
which is spending approximately $2.1 billion annually on health insurance, including for municipalities, school districts, and state employees, those employed by unions and, and, not, and not employed by unions. So we spent about a year and a half on that project and developed recommendations um, on how to address health care, the increasing cost of health care, um, by consolidating and aggregating uh, the benefits for municipal employees, of public employees, and school, school districts. In addition, at that time, um, as a deputy health official, I did work um, as a contributing member of a multi-department executive planning team that advised the governor on health, health reform and health policy and looking at strategic ways that our state could improve um, the way we deliver, purchase, deliver, um, and coordinate health care. That's my basic background. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we have at least one question. So, Mr. Dyson? Did you say two and a half million or two and a half billion? Billion. Technically, 2.1 billion, and we think that's an underestimate of currently being spent on health insurance. Sorry. I really have three questions. Okay. Now tell me where that money went, all the things it funded. So, let's see if I can remember. There is a very comprehensive report that's available online I can send you guys. But essentially, we looked at Medicaid spending, um, state what's being spent for state insurance, what all the municipalities and school districts are spending. It does not include um, the cost of Medicare, veterans, or TRICARE. Um, or any of the tribal health dollars that are going into the system. So that $2.1 billion is really isolated, and it was for 2016, um, to state funds that are going, or federal funds as well, that are going towards um, health insurance. And we looked at Medicaid uh, similarly and said, included that number, we separated out the federal dollars, but we did say, you know, if you're receiving Medicaid, it, it's considered, you know, health insurance of some sort, so we included those dollars. Now, if I may, so it's a pretty impressive uh, resume in a lot of places that are on it. I <clears throat> hope you have a good overview. In your career in this field, did you spend time working with clients? <coughs> Um, I have not been, I'm not a social worker or, or provided direct services, but when I, I worked for Boys and Girls Club from the time I could legally work and, and prior to that as a peer educator um, until I was a 28. So I spent a lot of time working directly with families and children in communities trying to coordinate. I mean, at Boys and Girls Club, if you're a staff member, you're coordinating care for lots of kids who have high risk situations. Before you got your training in official positions, you did quite a bit, but not much sense. Yeah, nope, I've worked really at a systems level and policy level. Yeah. All right, and if I may continue, Madam Chair, mm -hmm. uh, how many employees will you be supervising? I believe we have 105 employees. Yeah, so in another place where I've been exposed on a state level. <coughs> particularly on the social worker uh, uh, level, turnover was very high, and uh, this is a bad generality from somebody on the outside, but there were lots of people in supervisory positions had no real experience and perhaps short on skills to be supervising employees. And, and organizations. Um, so I'm interested in uh, your supervisory experience that will sure. prepare you for looking after 300, probably mostly caring, well qualified people. But. Absolutely. So uh, most recently, when I was the division manager, we had about 67, 70 ish, about 70% of the employees were in that division. So I did work and supervise that group of employees. Um, at my time at the state, I've always had, most of my positions, I've had a few employees that I supervise, and at Boys and Girls Club, um, down in the lower 48 and up here, I did have larger groups of staff, operating budgets, you know, facilities management. Um, in my role at Boys and Girls Club, 
I was a statewide area manager, so that included a region of Alaska and all their facilities, all of their community partners, all the relationships with the tribal organizations and the employees, um, and hiring, retention, and all of those um, functions in a rural setting. And then for a short period of time, I also sat in that role for the Anchorage area, so oversaw all the facilities, relationships, partnerships, <coughs> um, and employees in the Anchorage Bowl. How much of an issue is turnover? Um, I think turnover this, is, yeah. This organization and the 66 or whatever it was. You, you know, I don't, I couldn't probably tell you the exact percentage. I think, um, you know, retention of, of healthcare employees is always hard because there's lots of opportunities um, around the state. Uh, to get those jobs, and I think sometimes um, other employers may pay more. But I think at least for, I walked around the building and I saw a lot of familiar faces. I think we have some turnover with you know um, retirements. We have quite a few retirements that are happening. Um, so that's an ongoing issue is making sure that we're able to provide opportunities for the newer workforce that's coming in. So one of the things I think is probably even more challenging is making sure that our environment is prepared to bring in this new younger workforce um, that's coming in to replace a lot of the retirees. We were seeing that at the state as well. Um, so I couldn't tell you though for sure exactly what our turnover has been. And I don't want exact, but when you were supervising the 66, yeah. was turnover and filling vacancies a problem? Uh, no. I don't, no, I don't think it was a big problem. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Dyson. Mr. Gray? Josh, I've got an issue with alcohol. Sure. The abuse that we have suffered in this town. Since you come to the state background, you work for the state, what I need from you is I need to know how much money is brought in by state tax on alcohol for Anchorage. Not the licensing. I'm just interested in the tax. The state gets about $40 million a year on total right. alcohol tax. Yes, it does. And I'm trying to figure out how much of it comes back to this town represent on the geography it's raised in. Because I don't think we're being dealt with well by the state. Moreover, I want to know what we can, what you look for the future with a detox center. Because we need to get a new one for this town. I don't expect it today, but yeah. work on the data and get it to me. I will. Because that's the cause that I want to see done. I want to figure out how we blow the money out of jail and get it back down to where the money's raised. Yeah, and I'll, I'll get back to you on the, the detox question and also on how much is actually being spent, but I don't know if any of you have ever seen a presentation from the Matsu Health Foundation on their behavioral health um, dollars, but they did a really great analysis of how much other regions are getting versus themselves and have used that successfully to communicate why they should get more of the share of whether it's dollars coming to behavioral health treatment um, and services or prevention. And so I'm happy to pull that together yeah, and share that to you. Yeah. The other thing is a softball question. Tell me your philosophy on fluoride. fluoride. Because in your position, you're getting asked that question. Every couple of years, it recycles through. Whatever the mayor thinks. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I believe that I believe that fluoride is uh, well known to be um, a supported in the public health field as a broad environmental strategy to address caries in the community. And so, you know, broadly, that's the belief system. I grew up in Portland, Oregon, where they didn't have fluoride in the water. So there's always been an, an ongoing debate on that. And I think maybe recently they put it. I haven't kept up on their state, their city policies, um, but it is a well-known strategy to address community Every health needs. I'll make sure to have a really solid evidence-based talking point for you. But I do understand that's the. We do fluoridate the water here. Yes. So I appreciate that. Anytime you've got a question, come and talk to the summit. I know you work for the mayor, yeah. but you also work for the citizens of this town. Absolutely. And we deal with that. And we'll see you come budget time. I would like you not to be a stranger until budget time when we have your rapid attention. Sure. It's the rest of the time I'd like to hear from you. Absolutely. I'm available, and our team is available, and we've got a lot of resources and a lot of talent, um, and we have a lot of interest. One of the things that we I did talk with the team about is they are very interested in developing um, – we were, for lack of a better term, we were talking about a board, you know, an educational tool where we could actually um, educate the assembly and other uh, decision-making boards or thought leaders in the in the city about the function of public health, about the function of our department, but then um, broader, what are the kinds of policies that we don't have that we need, what are the policies that we do have, 
some of the just general statistics about things that are happening in our community that you may not be aware of that we're working on every day. And so we would like to develop that and bring that to this committee at some point in the future. That's something we would like to do. Um, marijuana scent. Uh, if you look at the marijuana license, I don't know if you've seen what we've done to marijuana. It cannot be detected by normal nodes. Define normal for me, it doesn't exist. So there is a machine out there called a nose ranger, I think, that runs about three thousand dollars and I'd be interested in you guys look into that to see if you need to buy it because I need this is a, uh, a machine that can scent that can uh -huh. detect that scent okay. rather than just saying a normal nose because those are very from person to person you have a lot of complaints with marijuana scent okay that's going to be your area the thing is animals good luck with that okay <laughs> thank I've been you on the body since 91 and it comes to dogs and chickens, good luck. Let us know how we can help you. Absolutely. We're going to get the complaints in you. And if you can do it your level before it gets to our level, I would sure appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. James. Mr. Dunbar? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I have a few questions. Um, unfortunately, I don't have to do with animals or noses with fluoride. Um, but, uh, so the the administration has uh, indicated that one of the major projects we hope to undertake in the next year or two, uh, actually it'll be a multi-year project, is a treatment facility or treatment mm -hmm. campus out past the airport. Sure. Um, and so I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on um, the feasibility of, of going forward with that, what the hurdles are that you see. Um, do you have any thoughts on funding? I'm, I'm open to any, any suggestions. Um, and just in general, uh, the familiarity or the prospects for the campus out there? Sure, so I did, um, I worked for Just Jesse for two years, and so I've, we've talked about campus all the time. It's been something I think that many people in Anchorage and Alaska's behavioral health system have wanted. Um, I, it wasn't my area of focus, so I'm, you know, I couldn't tell you exactly all of the components that need to be in it, but I do know that we have brought on, I think Nancy Burke is leading that charge, They've brought on a contractor that's working on design and scope and feasibility study, so we'll be able to speak to that um, in the near future. I don't know what the timeline is, uh, but I think with any project like that, that's going to include, you know, a large capital um, tag and complex operating funding structures, we're going to require, you know, partnerships at multiple levels. I think many of the aspects related to being able to actually fund the operating of, of a facility like that is really dependent on what the state's policies are going to be and what the 1115 waiver, um, whether it gets approved and once it gets approved, what that's actually going to look like, um, what the, um, the, how they would actually structure employees, all of those aspects are really completely dependent on the administrative service organization that this state is going to be pursuing for behavioral health or not, the 1115 waiver, and then the federal laws and whether they're going to approve those things and what kinds of opportunities we have. Um, as it relates to capital, I would assume, I'm just assuming, we would be partnering with the state, the um, Alaska Housing Finance Corporation, looking at HUD loans, looking at all the philanthropic organizations, Rasmussen and others, to support us, maybe national philanthropic organizations. So. I think it's a really big, complex project. I think it's really necessary, needed. I haven't talked to people about what the vision of that project will actually look like, but I'm, I'm definitely interested in being engaged in that and um, participating and seeing how, how it plays out here in this city. So going off of something that my colleagues said, one thing to discuss is using an alcohol tax to partially fund that kind of operation construction. Sure. I mean, alcohol tax is the number one evidence-based strategy to decreasing negative outcomes, including mortality related to alcohol. Um, I haven't looked at. I don't think the taxes have changed since I worked on it. I know we have some of the highest taxes in the country on some types of alcohol, and obviously there'd be a lot of um, <laughs> challenges to overcome. But it's an it's a it's a reasonable stream of resource to look at. So the other, it's interesting, you're coming in at an interesting time, I think, for the department because as 
that I see two of their biggest challenges or two of their biggest opportunities as well in the next few years are these large capital projects. So you have that treatment campus, which I have heard from my constituents that people are very supportive of. It. Um, and it's in sort of cross district, but I think the notion of getting more treatment in, in Anchorage is very much supportive. The, the second capital project, of course, is moving the HHS mm -hmm. building. Um, so, you know, <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> how, how are you going to do that? I mean, how involved are you going to be in that process? Um, I've been here for a couple days. I, I'm assuming that I'll have a lot of involvement with um, both of those uh, projects. Uh, I think it's no secret that the Department of Health and Human Services building is aged um, and that there needs to be that move. I understand there's plans in place uh, for that process, but I have not met with the team that is leading that effort and been briefed on it. So I couldn't speak to it today, but I'm happy to speak to you about it in the future. Okay. But absolutely, we're going to be loud, you know, it's going to be a big project, both of them. So, um, for everybody's knowledge, she's been on the job two days, and I've already spoken with her twice. So she's responsive. Um, <laughs> and that's good. And, and one was before she started a little bit. So um, I have a few things on my list here. One, Mr. Trini asked for a question of um, the alcohol tax revenue spent in Anchorage. I would like that to include. Um, alcohol expenditures made in Anchorage, the percentage sure. of statewide sales, so that we can get to a really clear asking for hours. Geographically, what comes in the process, and I want to know what the state that spends the same. Right, yeah, just to make sure you have both sides of that. Sure. Because I think it is disproportionate. Probably Anchorage spends way more on that tax than any other community, and other communities are being pretty generously funded with Anchorage's. So that's one okay. piece. Um, and I appreciate Mr. Dunbar talking about the treatment campus. One of my personal beefs is when we call it by its previous operator's name. So I hope we come up with our own brand and name for it, and not what it's always been known as, because I think it's unfair. Now, personally, as you all know, she and I have had, Tasha and I have had interactions over the years. When she was with the trust, sometimes it was a little contentious. Um, but that's what happens when you have difficult issues you're working on. And you're all trying to do something. So I am super grateful that the mayor appointed her. Um, I have now a couple of questions. Um, one is, what enhanced role do you think the health department could play in the mayor's and the assembly's very firm focus on addressing the homeless so I think for starters, um, I was just reviewing this with the, the team was kind of providing me with some of the things that they've been working on. I know that they've been working on, um, I just want to make sure I call it the right thing, um, you know, some, some recommendations on like homeless camp volunteer health and safety training recommendations. I mean, there's a very strategic and specific role that the health department can play with the functions that we already have within our department, including you know, making recommendations around vaccination, safety, all the kinds of different things that should be considered and coordinating with other departments that may have professionals that can train in those ways. So we have that very specific role that we can um, and will be, you know, hoping to take on and, and, and work with um, the mayor's office and others on that issue. Uh, we have, um, you know, Steve Ashman who works on the housing area already. So we have uh, quite a few programs that are in our department, but there's probably some enhancements there may be, I'm not as fully versed on all of the different things that the Nancy Burke and the team have been working on, but I know there's the mobile intervention teams which we're supporting now. So some of those things are um, partially supported by our department through administrative functions and others. And there may be some ways to um, embed uh, some of those, those things that are already implemented, maybe not on the policy side, but they're being implemented and there's a role for us with other departments as well. Um, so I'm sure there'll be many more conversations that we'll have about it. I think everyone in our leadership team is um, open and interested in already working on those issues from our PIO to our administrative staff and tasks. So there's a lot of opportunity and it's really just honing in on where are the appropriate places for us to be intervening more, interacting more. Great. So you got some ideas? Yeah, no, that's good. <laughs> uh, 
my experience now after touring some places doing other things is that the public health department is as key as the public safety or EMS in the problem solving Absolutely. in response. And so my neighbors have been asking a lot about what's the public health response to what's going on at the camps. And in fact, just today, this is personally show I kind of built at like the windmill is uh, figuring out a bathroom solution for the downtown because um, it's a public health crisis to walk by buildings and have human defecation sure. splattering on the sidewalk and on the buildings because people don't have anywhere else to go. And um, I think that that probably is enough for me. Sure, okay, Thank thanks. I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Constant. Mr. Kropp? Uh, no, sir. Thank you. Um, so officially, um, I've been trying um, to get a handle on the number of treatment beds for various addictions, alcohol and drug, and, and what's been happening to them. Uh, their costs and or qualifications that you have to have to have them, um, restricted to only women or only male members or only Medicare recipients or Medicare recipients, um, whatever those criteria are. My sense is, and it's been harder than I thought, I've been trying for a while, so then uh, Mr. Francis and I have been working on it. Um, my sense is that the actual number of treatment beds, at least in equity in the state of mind, has been flat or declining over a five to ten years. And that the most recent switch is trying to move everything to a Medicaid funding <coughs> model, which has a lot of advantages and I think some disadvantages. Um, and, and, and so um, I will be asking you all, I want to give you a little time sure. to get in, but that, that was, uh, there was an email traffic with your predecessor and I was going to restart it once you had the time to get settled in, but I wanted to warn you that that was coming. I, I, I want to get a handle on a non-fiction version So whatever help you, you can do on that. It, it was surprisingly difficult to get just some basic information. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Croft. Mr. Trey? Thank you, Mr. Madam Chair. Um, Matt, did you put the service in the building? We've had three studies that don't need to come down. Your people that work there told me numerous deficiencies that elevators should stop in the middle of transit and one for that doesn't work. So you're going to be coming to my assembly district. I welcome you. So get involved with this HHS building. Let us know your perspective, what they're planning meets your needs or doesn't. Okay. Let us something that not we can help you. Whether it's making the transit go there better or not, it's not the road to a down line. Right. We need to make sure this conversion happens. Absolutely. Next couple years, I'll have to see that operation. Absolutely. And the other thing is getting back to alcohol. The problem in the state is the state level we tax alcohol. At the city level, we don't tax alcohol. At the state level, we tax marijuana. At the city level, we tax marijuana. So why does one get away free? And when I take a look, they're both drugs. When I take a look at the adverse impact on society, we need to have money come in to take, to create treatment sessions. Absolutely. So, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Um, Mr. Thompson? Thank you. Another question. Um, last year, in the budget, we funded Four A's to provide a mobile meal exchange. Okay. And um, the harm reduction model makes perfect sense. But at the same time, there's a secondary problem happening. And this is happening all over the West Coast again, and that's that these needles aren't coming back. And that uh, the needles are ending up in our parks, as you mentioned, coming up with trainings for volunteers and strict protocols in terms of the staff. I was in San Francisco where the firefighters described putting out a fire in a supportive housing unit where they were crawling, because firefighters crawled over an inch of needles. And we don't have the problems to that degree, but it's something terrifying to contemplate. Do you know of any strategies for ensuring better return of needles so we don't see them in our parks? I don't know right off the top of my head strategies, but I'm sure that there's lots of communities that have implemented um, those programs, and they probably have lots of evidence-based opportunities. So I'll look into it and see. There's, I'm sure there's some way to incentivize it. Um, and I guess one thing I did have on here that I want to say, in, in addition to that, is that 
Uh, I think our department can play a very specific role in really enhancing our efforts around prevention because a lot of what we're doing right now is dealing with these bur burning fires, which is where we need treatment. We need, we're trying to figure out how to get these needles back in, but we really don't have as much uh, emphasis happening in a coordinated way on trying to actually prevent kids um, and families from moving into these things to begin with. And so one thing I would like to do, and you, you'll have no problem hearing from me, I'm pretty noisy personality, um, and I have a lot of passion around prevention, so I'll be coming as well to talk about that. So while we're looking at harm reduction strategies and treatment strategies and trying to really figure that out, I want to go upstream and figure out how can we as an assembly, as a community, as a Department of Health, do a better job of um, anchoring our community in prevention in addition. And the one idea that I haven't seen any research on is a bounty program. Basically pay them for the needles to come back. And then someone might actually collect them on our behalf. Yeah. And so I would love to hear back this one. So I agree prevention is the key. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Dyson? Thank you. So <clears throat> I suspect that all of us think you're going to be confirmed. And so this discussion has quickly moved beyond your qualifications, uh, past and hopefully future uh, things that need to be done, and so on and so forth. And this committee ought to be dealing with you with a lot of that stuff downstream. I'm not complaining about us talking to you about it now. Uh, <clears throat> when you run over your resume, my eyes will just thinking about this really neat lady who's with all these qualifications sitting through thousands of hours of meetings with all kinds of nice people who want to do good things. But some good must have come out of that. <laughs> <laughs> and as you look back, and particularly the ones where you were working with different groups on strategies, some of that work must have been insightful. And some of those must have produced some overall plans for attacking the problems that we and every other municipality has. And if you look back over that, and some of it seems like, yeah, that was really good, the work that was done. Too darn bad we didn't get it all done. You know. But this group of people, including our mayor, would be very glad to know about the, the good work that was done and how we can approach and solve problems. So, uh, and then I personally am interested in her master's thesis that hits on some subjects Mr. Traney has been talking about. And if you find that, I suspect my colleagues would be intrigued about that. Uh, Mr. Croft, as often happens, kind of wades through the fog and grabs some pretty seminal issues and holds them up, and it's part of his values and so on. We have been behind the curve on treatment for all of my adult life. And some other jurisdictions must have done some work that shows kind of what's the, the optimum we ought to be aiming at in terms of beds and clients and problems and some funding mechanisms that work. You know, and does, is there a national association of Public health administrators of some sort. Uh, yeah, there's. Um, we I think we recently joined a national association for uh, public health um, officials and county health organizations. Yeah. So, so there's some best practices in there. That yeah, we have. and I've been a part of a couple of those in other areas. Some of those have done some really good research work, and and we can learn some things from them. And I would encourage you to poke at that organization and see what they have in terms of problem solving, problem identification, problem solving. And if you find some jewels out there, this, this group of people, including this administration, are generally pretty darn interested in, in problem solving and there's a rumor that we can learn from others. <coughs> and and uh, so, I'm sorry I'm preaching, but I agree. Yeah, and I will ask our chair to have you after you, or your staff after you've been in place for a few months to come and tell us big picture of, of public health here. Okay. You know, Dr. Bishop Holman School District told me that she understands the syphilis has been increasing maybe 20% in 
400%. It's 400% over last year at the same time this year, we had a 400% increase in syphilis cases in Anchorage. So that's scary. It is scary. And, and I want to know who, what's the transmission? Who's the local distributors? That may be private protected health information, but <laughs> we can talk about the strategies that we're putting in well, place and what we're doing. Well, I'm not wanting to read HIPAA rules. Yeah. But we want to know. And, and as we talked about before this meeting started, uh, I want to know, and I think my colleagues okay. do, what can we do to help? Okay. And, and we can change ordinances and we can influence the budget, use our charm for intimidation. We, I think we all want to focus on what can we do that's going to make a material difference in the real world in real time. And uh, I've been married 50 years. I'm used to doing what I'm told. <laughs> and I'd be very glad for you and your team to tell us what we can do. I'm sorry, I'm stating the obvious. But, <clears throat> but Mr. Cranston has been pretty darn good at, uh, and several others of saying we got huge problems and ignoring them and kicking the ball down the field, it doesn't get it. So, anyways, okay. I'm sorry, I'm preaching. Yeah. Well, for the record, my, um, my thesis is that the consortium library is publicly available. It was on underage drinking. The impacts of underage drinking laws, or uh, pardon me, the impacts of um, drinking laws on underage youth in rural Alaska. So that was looking at dry, damp, wet communities. Um, and the rates of, um, of injury to underage youth who had alcohol in their systems and whether or not there was a variance in uh, those kinds of policies and impacts on kids. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to talk about successes. I think that the, the work that I do and in the work we do in public health and prevention and coalitions in general is really downstream and so long term. But one example of, of a community that I worked with as a grant manager um, and for a brief time as their coalition coordinator is Matsu, and they have done incredible work um, around coordinating a really diverse like community the size of West Virginia around um, the issues of substance abuse. They've um, hosted, they've moved from kind of, when I was working with them, it was on capacity building level, and they are now hosting you know, large scale prevention summits, hosting large scale community conversations about opioids and, and other things. So they've really done a great job of taking the public health model related to coalitions and implementing it in their community. And so I can't at all take credit for any of that, but I can say that that's the kind of work I'm passionate about, and I think that's the stuff that we can also do here. Um, it's just it's very long downstream work. Yeah. Yeah. So ultimately we're interested in results, yeah. and quantifying those are really tough in your field. There's so many variables. Ultimately, as we evaluate what works, you got to see what the score is. What does the, the data show? Either the rate of growth of the problem is flattened, or it's diminishing, or whatever. Well, in the future, I'm happy to share. We have data on projects that this department has already been working on related to, you know, STIs, syphilis, gonorrhea, the, the mumps outbreak recently, and things that they've actually done numbers-wise to contain those outbreaks and decrease them. So I'm happy to share that at a future time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Madam thank Chair. you, Mr. Dyson. Mr. Train? I look forward to your confirmation on Tuesday. I don't think there'll be a problem with that. Just one last thing. I didn't, last mayor, I talked to one of his directors and said, I only tell you what I want to tell you the mayor wants you to know. And then we cut our budget. So please don't <laughs> follow that way. Sure. You may work for the mayor, but ultimately we approve the budget. And we Absolutely. Have to. I'll make I'll sure. I'll sure work with you on issues. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Train. Mr. Thompson? Thank you. So, now more of a philosophical question about the confirmation. These are, this is an uncomfortable question, but I'm sure you can answer it. What do I tell the people who have said to me, what, why her, right, the ones that are naysayers? What do I tell them? 
Um, you know, Christopher, you'll tell them what you want. <laughs> you'll tell them what you really think. Um, I think, you know, I've always had this philosophy, and especially in coalition work, that if I make, if, if everybody's unhappy, then I've been successful in my job because that means that not one person got exactly what they wanted and that we um, came up with a compromise. And a lot of times when you have a really strong opinion or position about what you're passionate about, whether it's retiree benefits, whether it's beneficiary issues related to trust beneficiaries, homelessness, substance abuse, the money that you currently get that you don't want to share with your community, all of those kinds of issues, you're not going to be happy when you walk away and you had to compromise or um, things didn't work out exactly in your favor and that's what you wanted. So, you know, I'm really comfortable with, you know, discourse and um, uncomfortable conversations and I try really hard to maintain positive, you know, relationships even with people who may not appreciate my point of view or how I negotiated a particular issue and so I'm okay with that. I don't think everybody's going to be 100% happy that with anything that I do um, in general. That's just life and I'm, you know, I'd say I try to be fair and and look at all sides of the issue and, and um, in, in those kinds of settings we all have to bring something and leave something at the table. That's my yeah, personal opinion. That's exactly Thank you. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Does anyone else on the body have any questions? I actually have one sure. for you. Um, we've talked about a number of different health issues facing the community and um, do you identify which you think are the top three health issues facing our community and um, your priorities or goals in addressing them and also what you think are the big challenges for the department? Okay, so what are my, what I think the number one problems, top problems solutions. solutions and challenges? Well, obviously I have a little bit of a bent towards alcohol and I always have. I think that um, Alaska, you know, if you look at community health rankings, we rank really high in a lot of areas, particularly Anchorage um, itself, more than in some areas of the state related to multiple issues. But I think that um, substance abuse, uh, and so I'll throw them all in there together, is a number one issue. Um, it's not an issue that we work on exclusively or even kind of at the, at the department at this point. Um, obviously, our rates of sexual transmitted, uh, sexually transmitted infections is highly problematic. You might not know our numbers, but we'll make sure that you do know them over time. And I think that um, is impacting quality of life, length of life, and the cost of health care in, in our city and probably in our state, um, unmanaged, untreated, um, you know, sexually transmitted infections as well as um, easily preventable um, diseases that you could be immunized for or vaccinated for. Um, so those are two issues that I care really about from the public health, and I'm really passionate about water quality, <laughs> which um, I haven't really dug into what we do at our department, but I'm pretty active in the Fish Creek watershed. So that's just a personal area of interest. I'm not sure where it falls. I, I haven't had time really to sit down and say, here's the top three priorities and how they fit into our health department and what are the specific solutions. But I think one of the things is that our, at least I felt like I wasn't able to do when I was a division manager was really communicate out the success that our clinical staff are having and the work they're doing related to tuberculosis and sexually transmitted infections. And um, I think that we are doing a good job at that and there's more to do. Um, I think it's very important, but I think quality of life would, all the quality of life factors are going to be important to us. So I, I probably will come back to you maybe with my top three and what I think those solutions are maybe in this more global um, vision of where uh, we're going to go. But obviously I want to rely on my leadership team who has a lot of experience and is, is in, has been in the trenches doing this work for the last few years. And offhand, um, what would you say the big challenges for the department are? I think they're going to be, you know, funding um, is really it's a big factor. We don't have enough, I think there's gonna, I don't, I can't say for sure because I haven't sat and looked through everything, but I think having enough um, people on the ground that can get out and do the things that people want. So wanting to improve community conditions requires um, having um, staff and with state budgets, I think being cut and a lot of things being moved to Medicaid funding for things that have traditionally had um, grants that you could get and use um, more freely than say a fee-for-service system. And we're not really operating in a, you know, public health requires lots of environmental strategies that can't be tied to a service 
level delivery that I could bill for. And so looking, um, one of the top things I'll be looking at is how to increase our resources into the department, whether it's federal funds, state funds, um, philanthropy, and also coming to the you know assembly to see what we can do to make sure that the things that you guys want to have happen can happen because we only can do so much with the number of people that we have. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Um, thank you very thank much. You. Ms. Amanda, let me also take this opportunity to wish you a very happy birthday. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thank you. There is light after 30. Um, yeah, I'm hitting on 40. So this is like the decade. I heard it's the best one. So supposedly. So far, so good. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. So, um, okay. We have one more item on the agenda. And actually, you see how many folks are here um, to testify who want to speak? Anybody? Okay. Um, we'll try to save a couple minutes at the end just in case we change their mind. But now um, we'll go ahead and um, at least take a few minutes Mr. the training to, to introduce your... Um, We've got two versions in front of you. One is the AO, the original one. What was that was brought forward using old, using the old way they did it originally. The S version has taken a look at experiences across this country using the old version, and then they've improved it with the S version. And I appreciate the engaged working on this. We'll be introducing this in the 17th public hearing in sometime in August, but it'll be in front of the body. There's a lot of support out there, I think, for getting rid of plastic bags. We also want to build in so that you can have, you can have biodegradable plastic bags. So I've been talking to some people that are making it up hemp, quite frankly, that uh, they can plant it in the ground it's biodegradable. So we need to make sure we deal with that because things are going to change. But I think it's time to get rid of plastic bags because they blow in the wind. You go to any store and they hand it to you in a plastic bag, walks out and blows away. We need to end that. It's happened all over the United States. Wasilla has already done this. So has some of the other towns. This time, Anchorage, the largest state, largest city in the state. So that's what we're bringing it forward. It's time. Thank you, Mr. Trainee. And uh, this item is set or will be set for public hearing on the 14th of August. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And with a possible work session. We'll have a work session. Work session. Yes. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to get it out here because with this new committee, you need to take a look at it. Gives you time to look at it, see what's wrong with it, what's right with it. Dean Gates is responsible for this. I thank you very much, because quite frankly, overworked it, and I appreciate it. He even busted his arm doing work on this stuff. So. <laughs> so that's all I've got. Thank you, Mr. Trainee. Does anyone have any questions or comments? So why not the tax? I, I heard you've been considering because uh, they tried that and the public was opposed to that. It was just easier than something you threw in was next size tax. And uh, the state tried to do that. Actually, it was Andy Joseph that tried it and just got killed on the state level. So I didn't want to try that. If it did work on the state, let's not try to do it here. Let's just do it now right now and get it done. And there's enough alternatives to plastic. Is this your idea that it would come to a specific committee or come to a work session on kind of the whole? Either way. It's up to the chairman or I can send it to my, my uh, policy committee, whatever you want to do. I'd love to have the retailers. And across the street is a, a, a constituent who's very active on this and other environmental issues. We talked about it. She corners me. Um, very good about it. And um, I think she'll be heading up some of the support for this. She, ha she did say in a recent conversation that look at some of the cities that have done it and it's really a mixed implementation that is some provide even worse plastic bags so they're not disposable anymore they're just bags that are and some just routinely then give uh, paper bags which may be better worse depending on um, <coughs> that's the reason it is where she deals with that because that's what they found out some of the towns in the original version is they just thicken out the plastic bag and that's not what we really want because that last what, 100, 200 years long past our lifespan. That'll be an interesting so, discussion. Thank you. For the I think the industry, many of the industry, wants to get on board on this. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Mr. Gates? 
Oh, yeah, I was just going to say I would recommend a book session on this probably for August 10th Friday for the um, 14th uh, Zoom hearing. Um, I want to be there present for the book session. Then I'm out of state and July 30th to August 9th. Uh, so, uh, but perhaps it might be wise to have a book session before and tomorrow to so we'll just bring sufficient. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Mr. Dunbar? Yeah, I think on that we might have we might have two work sessions. That we have one earlier before you leave. Uh, I want to have the opportunity to maybe have an S version of this or an S one version in this case if there are some issues. For me, and this is the first chance to talk about it, um, I have a couple of concerns. The first is what we talked about before that the sort of unintended consequences that we actually end up with more plastic use or other kinds of equally undesirable. Options, uh, and I'd love to talk about the ways we can structure this in a way that doesn't do that. Uh, the second is, you know, I, I represent constituents. Um, I represent a lot of these constituents that are uh, lower income or working class. Uh, that's the nature of my district, and I am worried to a certain degree about the impact on them. And Mr. Constant is here, but he and I have talked about nonprofit partnerships, but it might be that this county has to take a more direct role in that. But there are a number of communities my district that use these bags for household, you know, for garbage bags or for dog bags and that kind of thing. So I just want to make sure that we are uh, taking them into account uh, when we go forward with this. So I'm willing to have multiple work sessions. Um, I think there'll be a lot of public testimony on this. I appreciate the sponsors are not trying to rush it, um, that we have time to discuss it as a community and time to work through it. Unintended consequences. So, um, I guess that's no, no no real question in there. Just a preview of the discussion in the coming months. Thank you, Mr. Dunbar, Mr. Trini. Madam Chair, what I'm looking at too is an invitation one January, because I want to give the business a chance to work through the products we've already got in the pipeline. So I'm looking at one January an invitation. I had some people that want to do it on Earth Day, but that's in April. And quite frankly, I think. January the 1st, 2019, gives us enough time to plan for this. Thank you, Mr. Train. Mr. Constant? Thank you. Um, so, I heard lots of uh, media that San Francisco was the first community to do this in 2007. <coughs> but I recently learned in 2000, I think the same year in Alaska passed a plastic bag. And so, a tiny little village in Alaska was actually the leader. And um, we're falling behind, right? Soldatna, Wasilla. Palmer, St. Mary, Alaska. So we have a duty in some ways to do this and not waste too much time getting there. And I appreciate the concerns about what to do with individuals and communities that might be um, challenged by fees that may arise from this. And I believe we'll come up with an answer to that. In fact, we got an email, or I, I got a communication from um, one of our shelter providers that said we give away 3,200 bags a week in the provision of our services. And that means we shouldn't do this. And um, I disagree with the conclusion, but the process then thinks, what are we going to do? And in fact, someone immediately in the conversation pitched that they would underwrite reusable bags for that organization. And they said, well, but they don't ever come back with their bags. This is an opportunity for training. And also, those bags that go out are going to go into low income homes that are going to be able for people to have to go to the grocery store and reuse. And so I see a lot of positive possible um, social norms changes that we can work on in this process. And I look forward to the deliberations. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. So I guess this is a question for Mr. Gates. We've got a couple minutes. So uh, we always think about these reusable bags that are these disposable bags as we get a Fred Meyer or cars or what have you. But um, we also go to things like the Avenge at the uh, AEDC. Um, and we get the thicker, slightly thicker, but I think still tend to be disposed of bags with you know a variety of pamphlets and goodies in it. Uh, are those are those considered disposable bags in this ordinance? Oh, um, one of the definition of disposable plastic bag that's very common is uh, based on thickness of the plastic. 2.25 mils is kind of standard to describe these thinner ones that we get from the grocery store. And four mils is a set of thickness 
that's not, and I think that for me, this would cover those thicker ones you get at the health fair, for example. I'm not past you, though. I think I need some little technical expertise about the thickness to show is a full mil over and under back, at 2.5 mil over and under back. That would probably be helpful for us. Yeah, I think we need to, uh, share my, my follow up on that. I think we need to have those kind of conversations uh, as we go forward with this next month, the work session. We need to actually get that level of technical expertise so we don't, again, create unintended consequences or uh, a sort of unfair situation where the wealthy organizations can give out bags, but the uh, sort of public facing organizations do not. Thank you, Mr. Um, if I may, um, Mr. Dunbar, who work on getting me to that, what types of bags? I just want to mention the definition of a retail seller here and in many of the other organizations in the state of Alaska that I'm convinced of that. Find it as uh, the bags getting from a retail sale from a business facility or a permanent structure, and so that wouldn't apply to, for example, bags given away at the Saturday market or a temporary health fair or some uh, waste tent structure at Park Strip, things like that. So we need to look carefully at what's being accepted here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gates. We're just out of, about out of time, but we have two more people in the queue. Can we continue for please? So, yeah, on that point, uh, the retail function is key. That would exclude or exempt the homeless facility. And um, I did hear that Wasilla and Walmart skirted the ruling by providing a thicker plastic bag. And that's where this formula designation is important because that's actually getting closer to one of those very reusable bags compared to something that's really disposable. Thank you, Mr. Constant. Mr. Dyson? Yeah. <coughs> for our future. I am stunned by this statistic that syphilis is up 400% in one year. Uh, that comes very close to being a health crisis and I would encourage you, Madam Chair, to ask Ms. Benita, as soon as they can be prepared to make a presentation to the committee on uh, those kind of health crises that we are facing and our people are facing uh, and then ask for uh, subsequently a presentation on the subject Mr. Croft brought up is where we're at on treatment and what's the way forward because uh, I obviously see those as huge crises for us as a city and our people. Thank you, Mr. Dyson. Um, one final point, we, we are out of time, and we, at some point, should have a discussion about our priorities of the committee, and I think a number of them have been brought up in these discussions, but that's definitely something we'll need to carry forward. Thank you all for attending. This meeting is adjourned.